Hello, my name is Sean Spear. I'm the project co-director of the Ontario 360 Project at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. As viewers know, uh, we've been releasing a series of policy papers over the past several weeks and months, all focused on the big question of the province of Ontario's post-pandemic recovery. As part of this work, we've published papers on subjects including investment attraction, fiscal federalism, uh, micro-credentialing, and so much more. And I'm pleased to tell you today that we have a new paper out uh, entitled Transit-Oriented Communities, Why We Need Them and How We Can Make Them Happen. And I'm thrilled to be uh, joined today by my project co-director, Drew Fagan, who also co-authored uh, this paper, and his co-author, Matty Simiatiki, um, to talk about um, the paper and it, uh, how it can inform and shape uh, the government of Ontario's um, in investments in public transit um, to support uh, the post-pandemic recovery in the short term and, um, and improve uh, uh, economic and social well-being of people in cities uh, over the long term. Uh, Maddie and Drew, thanks for the contribution, and I'm thrilled to be uh, here with you today. Maddie, maybe let's just start um, uh, at the kind of basic level. Uh, I think a lot of viewers will, will be familiar with uh, some of the big questions around public transit, the need for public transit investment, but they may not be familiar with the idea of transit-oriented communities. Can you just give viewers a sense of what this means and, and why it's relevant in the context of um, the, the province and indeed the federal government's thinking about um, major public transit investments over the coming, over the coming years? Thanks, Sean, and, th and it's nice to be with you. Uh, Transit-oriented communities are really the other side of the coin of public transit infrastructure investments. Housing and land use go very closely together. The way that our cities are built uh, are deeply implicated and influenced by uh, the types of transportation that uh, is in place, whether it's car-oriented, transit-oriented, walking-oriented. Now, transit-oriented communities bring together people and activity within close proximity of transit stations. That transit is an attractor uh, of people because of the stations, it provides greater accessibility. And so there's an, a, an incentive and, and a motivation to bring people close to that, uh, that, trans, that transit. Now, transit-oriented communities are made up really of three key characteristics. First is density, uh, that you want um, a tight, uh, compact area uh, of, of, or amount of people uh, and, and building and activity within close proximity of the station. So that's usually within a 10 to 15 minute walk from, uh, from the station. Second is diversity of uses, that the key is to have a mix of uses around these stations uh, so that they are uh, activated and animated uh, throughout the day. And then finally is high quality design, that, that the goal is to have good quality design so that the neighborhoods are appealing and walkable uh, and, uh, and that people want to spend time in these neighborhoods. With the research uh, by uh, Robert Cervera and Carol Cockleman, who came up with these three Ds of transit-oriented uh, uh, developments, uh, the, this approach really drives better community building and it drives higher transit usage on the systems that are being built. Hmm. It's so fascinating because, um, you know, I, I think one of the key insights of the paper is the idea that we, we can't think of public transit investments in isolation, that we need to think of them as part of this broader um, policy agenda, all oriented towards um, improving the livability, accessibility, and kind of efficiency of our cities. And uh, the three Ds, um, you know, is, a, I think, a, a useful framework for thinking about how to inform that kind of holistic uh, approach. Uh, Drew, one of the other insights in the paper is that, well, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, there is kind of heightened interest in transit-oriented communities. It's not necessarily a new idea that, um, and, you know, that there have been previous attempts or, or focuses on trying to um, use public transit investments to um, catalyze um, transit-oriented communities, but uh, those efforts have produced sort of so-so results, that there have been some impediments that have um, have blocked progress. Do you want to just talk a bit about what are the typical obstacles to making progress on, um, on transit-oriented communities that policymakers need to be cognizant of? 
Yeah, and I'd, I'd say first that part of the reason why there's increased interest is because so much is going on in terms of development, to Maddie's point, with regard to getting most value out of transit investment. The Ontario government, just as one example, is going to spend $150 billion on infrastructure over the next 10 years. And the biggest individual component of that is transit, the four transit lines that are at issue right now through the uh, through Toronto and the Great Greater Toronto area are worth about $30 billion of that. So huge investment, let's get the best value out of it. And another part of the impetus is the fact that pandemic has left people with a greater desire to be able to shelter in place, if you like, but also build out neighborhoods in a more coherent way to Maddie's point about the three Ds. So then the question becomes, what's the challenge of actually doing this? What's so hard? And so many of the challenges come down to the complexity of government, uh, the multiple actor challenge we talk about, which is not just government itself, but the relationship between private and public sector, the size of investment that's necessary, and the, and the need to coordinate so many actors. Um, it's, it's hard to bring the private sector together with regard to um, the agglomeration, the co uh, coordination of land uses. Um, and then on top of that, there are multiple ministries that are involved in the decision-making process from the infrastructure Infrastructure Ministry to the Housing Ministry, Municipal Affairs, and many others when you get to Maddie's point with regard to having all sorts of uses, including social policy. Um, so it's very complex to uh, negotiate that. And part of the role, that we, part of what we did in the paper tried to do was try to make sense of that and provide um, opportunities to do it better. You, you, the, the, you and uh, Maddie referred to the kind of complexity of these interactions across different orders of government, different ministries, even within a single government, and to say nothing of the broader stakeholder community as a rubrics cube. And, you know, what's interesting, Drew, just having you um, uh, outline some of those impediments, just in parentheses, it reminds me of a previous paper that we published on um, investment attraction. And one of the challenges being it's hard to get all of the different parts of the government kind of rowing in the same direction with respect to trying to attract um, particular investment when the different policy levers uh, reside across different ministries. And in some ways, um, uh, one of the obstacles of transit-oriented communities is the same, is, is a kind of similar principle. How do you get, um, you know, different policy levers across different ministries and different orders of government kind of all align towards the same overall goal. In, in that vein, um, Maddie, um, in your recommendations, uh, you outline some operational and kind of governance tools to try to achieve that coordination and alignment. Do you want to just talk a bit about um, that and, and how you think it may um, mitigate some of the coordination challenges that, uh, that Drew just described? For sure. It's quite remarkable when you think about how many ministries and how many different departments uh, within government uh, are uh, involved and have a touch point with transit oriented communities uh, between the planning department, between the building services uh, uh, department, between the school boards, the library board, uh, all of the different uh, um, and then all the way up to the provincial ministries uh, and even with the federal government between the infrastructure itself and the, 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 then the housing, uh, combined with the private sector and often having to assemble land when land is owned by multiple uh, different parties as well, uh, and, then, and then engaging communities is really a, a, a remarkably uh, diverse and dispersed set of responsibilities that can be very challenging. One of the things that is a feature of the Canadian uh, policy landscape is, uh, is, is diffusion and, a, and, and really a, a shortage of venues where coordination and collaboration happens. Mm -hmm. um, that, that there may be tables within each levels of government where they come together uh, to, to coordinate, uh, but between them is very challenging. And transit-oriented communities are, the, are really one of the gaps where you need coordination across all of these different uh, uh, policy spheres if you're gonna make a successful, mixed-use, dense, well-designed uh, community that also uh, is done in a timely fashion as transit is, 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 is built. One of the, the points we speak about is creating these tables where collaboration happens, where people actually sit together and talk 
through the issues and the dynamics about how these projects should uh, should be done. And you would think that uh, that this is is done as a matter of course, um, but there in fact are very few of these coordinated uh, tables and 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 and, and uh, places, policy spheres where people actually come together across government. We think that. Um, that there could be a real value in creating for, for each transit-oriented community uh, a table of the different levels of government that would be required to be involved uh, in order to help smooth that process, to create the relationships, to uh, uh, overcome challenges that are in place, and, and to really accelerate uh, this and make sure that the policy and the practice are uh, rowing in the same direction. That's great, Mandy. Um you know, I, one of the things one can start to see across different papers uh, this year, Drew, is the idea that um, we need greater intentionality in our policy making. And, and um, you know, it sounds um, both in terms of reading the paper and in hearing um, your thoughts today that intentionality is one of the um, crucial ingredients to kind of overcoming some of those obstacles with respect to transit oriented communities and, and, and making greater progress. Um, Drew, one of the other um, questions um, that I had in reading the paper and you guys um, outline is the question of time horizons and kind of balancing, you know, I think uh, a, 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 an interest on the part of policymakers and others to try to accelerate progress and on um, timelines for major construction projects and so on, um, but at the same time balancing that with the need to um, build kind of bottom up community support, um, have the kind of stakeholder engagement that will enable um, uh, transit oriented communities to flourish. Um, and in some ways this comes right back to the three Ds, doesn't it? Do you wanna just elaborate, Drew, you know, for policymakers who, who, who may be placing um, a, a kind of hyper emphasis on expediting construction um, you know, and the need to balance that with some of these other con considerations in order to kind of create the conditions for um, durable uh, and ultimately successful transit-oriented communities? Sure. I guess there isn't a sweet spot, but maybe there's a sweet continuum or something or a balance because right now some of the concern coming out of one particular high profile development, the Ontario line, um, is the uh, concern in communities along that line that the development may take place at a pace in which density, one of the three Ds, gets priority attention. So it happens quickly and you don't have a balanced development. On the other side, we've struggled. In fact, over the last 30 years, the first steps towards transit-oriented development, transit-oriented communities were taken taking place was Maddie in the in the early 1990s and we write about that and in some cases those haven't still haven't been built out given the cost of them given financing challenges and all the like so finding that balance is fundamental and the other sensitivity as you point out Sean is it's not like these are universally beneficial um, if in from the perspective of certain or uh, certain groups um, you know uh, there's an impact uh, with regard to gentrification because uh, uh, land values go up um, there's plenty of value with regard to um, and change with regard to who's using that land as it develops and we need to be sensitive to all these uh, diverse interests and therefore that's why Maddie uh, and, and I talk about the need for greater um, you know community uh, organization and interest and coordination among all, among all those interests and it's remarkable that there really aren't tables in order to do that it's hard enough within government to organize horizontally to use the parlance of government across ministries say at Queen's Park or federally it's even harder when you're doing it vertically federal um, uh, provincial and then municipal and across the GTA there's regional government and in many cases multiple um, municipal governments involved as all well. so it becomes very complicated very quickly and we need to grapple with all of that. Now, Drew, Sean, if I can just jump yes, in and just please. add to Drew's comment, which I think is is, is really important to reinforce, is um, the 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 paradox that's out there of you know the the provincial government and governments of all levels building transit, high order transit, 
especially now in, in the inner suburbs, uh, aiming transit towards low income communities, racialized communities, newcomer communities who have often been excluded from uh, high quality transit for the longest time uh, and creating real barriers uh, uh, to, to full uh, inclusion. Um, and, and the risk then, the paradox and the risk that that transit will then accelerate gentrification. And in many ways new, it will end up being different communities and different people uh, who end up actually being the beneficiaries of that new public transit is a real risk. And, and transfer into communities then, and the way that we're, we're thinking about them uh, really is, is about how you mobilize development uh, without driving uh, displacement and about how you achieve uh, community building that allows growth to take place while benefiting uh, the people that are there, the businesses that are there and serving the communities. And it's to, to Drew's comment, really the, the coordination the, the, and, and the impetus right now is to go very quickly, uh, especially with this provincial government to go very quickly and, and, and in many cases to focus on density. And the risk there is at is, 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 is at the risk of, uh, of diversity of uses, of, of high quality design, and of a process that accelerates uh, runaway increases in prices and ultimately gentrification. Hmm. It sounds like there's a, another paper there, Matty, uh, for us to commission um, on, on how you uh, try to overcome that paradox, which I think is, is well put and, and kind of an interesting insight. I, I um, lived in, uh, uh, Brooklyn, New York for some time, mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of politics of gentrification were explosive um, mm -hmm. in a way that I, um, you know, maybe this is a reflection of privilege, but I, that I hadn't encountered um, um, elsewhere. And so I think, you know, not only uh, is it important um, to, to, to address the issues you're describing in the name of inclusion, but it's also necessary in the name of political stability and social cohesion, um, you know, which is something that uh, we, we, we all, you know, ought to agree should be a priority. I guess just last question for both of you, um, you, you know, we focused primarily on your recommendations with respect to dealing with the coordination problem. Maybe I'll just open up a, a, a kind of general question to both of you. Um, Drew, why don't I start with you and then Maddie can wrap up. Uh, kind of two-parter. First of all, are there any other recommendations that you think uh, ought to be emphasized here? And then more just more generally, what do you think, you know, for people who are hearing what you're saying, you know, who probably who may not have thought deeply about transit-oriented communities, can you just paint a picture of what success would look like? Like a decade from now, you know, we've had both at the federal level and provincial level unprecedented investments in public transit. If we do it well, we don't just get more transit, we actually get um, better, more livable, more inclusive, more dynamic cities. So maybe just paint a picture in your mind uh, what success would look like and what of any of the other recommendations we haven't talked about you think are kind of crucial to achieving that success. Sure. So the highest profile line of the four we've been talking about is the Ontario line, which will go downtown from downtown Toronto to the east up uh, across the Danforth and as, as far north as, as roughly the Science Center. And, you know, there are opportunities there at Girard Street, for example, where there are a couple of big, almost, you know, sub look, suburban looking malls underused in which you could develop, inter you know, some towers, limited towers, intermediate uses with regard to housing, but also mixed use with regard to commercial and with regard to to um, public services, so medical services, affordable housing, uh, community hubs. We write about community hubs, and Maddie's been doing a lot of work with regard to community hubs, which are individual buildings which will provide childcare services, medical services, all sorts of services within a short walk of communities, including affordable housing, to get at the point we're making with regard to inequality. So there are all sorts of opportunities, even as a city as dense as Toronto, um, to actually build back better, to use the terminology, not just now, but over the next decade, taking advantage of the billions of dollars we're putting into transit. Ma Maddie, maybe you want to talk a bit more about community hubs, because it's a real um, specialty of yours. Yeah, and I, I, I think that really picks up on uh, what's possible here, which is development in the service of community and the, this idea right. of community hubs brings together uh, different uses uh, the idea of having a school co-located with a recreation center with a daycare with a library with an entrepreneurial 
uh, uh, facility, you know, so that communities have access to a uh, great quality services. And in fact, the services can change in the way that we uh, engage people and, and use space to drive more inclusive uh, education programming and programming that enables people of all ages and all backgrounds to, to, to participate. And, uh, you know, example, there's an example in Brampton where uh, this is being planned uh, uh, by the city of Brampton with their uh, stakeholders and in other cases, uh, communities coming together uh, like at Jane and Finch to drive uh, a really uh, uh, progressive and innovative idea of a community hub uh, in, in, in their community. So really just rethinking how we co-locate different uses around that idea of diversity of land uses and then to Drew's comment ensure that we're, we're also uh, achieving affordability and, uh, and and livability. I think this is if we were to look back in 10 years if, if, if the idea of transit oriented communities uh, takes hold what will, what you'll see uh, is not just a, a dense density around our new transit stations but really thriving communities that are uh, inclusive sustainable and just. Right. Well, that's wonderful. That's and that's a um, you know I think a compelling picture that um, uh, uh, of the future that ought to grab policymakers, that ought to grab Ontarians, and um, if they want to learn more about the vision and the kind of action plan to realize it, they can go to uh, on360.ca to read uh, Drew and Maddie's paper, uh, as well as the other papers that we've published over the past several weeks and months. I'm pleased to tell viewers we'll have a series of papers forthcoming on topics including uh, long-term energy planning, um, uh, manufacturing of broadband, healthcare, education, and so on. So um, please stay tuned to this channel and, and, and go to our site to uh, find more information about the work we're doing, including this tremendous paper um, um, that, uh, that we've just discussed today. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for your contribution and for today's discussion. Um, I, I, I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks, Thanks Sean. Sean.